Hi, everybody, and a very pleasant good evening to you wherever you may be. This is Comfortably Zone Radio, and it's time for Dodgers baseball, a tale of two cities from Brooklyn to Los Angeles. My name is Peter Trunk, and my co-host, as always, Ron Rabinovitz and Robert Cole. I want to start off with Ron Rabinovitz. We want to talk a little bit about number 31, the erstwhile first base coach of the Brooklyn Dodgers who did not make the trip out to L.A., uh, Jake Pittler. Ronnie Rabinovitz, tell us a little bit about Jake. Okay, how are you doing, Peter? Okay, um, doing well. Jake Pittler, um, in 1913, uh, he was playing for a Class C Southern Michigan uh, 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 Association. It was disbanded in 1915, and he was picked up by a Chattanooga team in the Southern Association. 1917, uh, during World War I, there was a lot of uh, athletes that were, were gone at the war. So the Pittsburgh Pirates picked him up, picked him up and he played uh, two contests uh, in 1917 and two contests in 1918. He batted 232. <laughs> And then he was out of organized baseball for a while. And uh, he was picked up uh, in the New York, uh, Pennsylvania League in Billingham. Uh, And from there on, he was a manager in Scranton in 1934. And in 39, he joined the Dodgers as a minor league manager. working back uh, and then working back into the Pony League uh, in 39 and 40. In 1947, he joined the Dodgers for 10 years till 1957. He was a first base coach. He decided he worked under uh, DeRocher, uh, Schotten, uh, Dressen, and Alston. And he was considered a fatherly figure to the rookies. He retired in 1957. He did not want to go west, but he was a scout for the Dodgers for many years. He died in 68 at the age of 73. He was inducted into the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, He was quite a guy. Uh, I knew him actually pretty well. I met him in Milwaukee several times when the Dodgers were there, and we would kibitz about he being Jewish and me being Jewish, and uh, wow. uh, he talked to me about bar mitzvahs and this and that. I've had his autograph. He was a good guy. He was a really good guy. So that's Jake Pittler. Um, he was a great coach and a scout for the Dodgers for many years. By the Jake way, I'd Pittler. like to say happy birthday today to Babe Ruth. Oh, yeah. His birthday is today in 1895. <laughs> I heard of him. Yeah, did you hear him? Yeah, I heard about that. He was guy. at his birthday party. Oh, he was great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, happy birthday, Dave Ruth. And getting back to Jake Pittler, Jake Pittler was not unlike uh, Casey Stengel in one respect, and that is even when they were young, they looked old. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, yes. He always looked old. Jake Pittler looked right old when he was 25, and so did uh, Casey. Yep. Yeah. And he was Weird. a little guy. He was not a big guy. He was about 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, yeah, I remember nice on a game. couple of the uh, the baseball recordings, you know, the old games, yeah. Barber used to refer to him as Sugarfoot Jake. And I never <laughs> Sugarfoot. Out. Yeah, Sugarfoot. <laughs> and I never could figure that out. I'm also seeing here where uh, Pittler's brothers were involved in sports as well. One of his brothers uh, managed Billy Kahn, the former uh, light heavyweight and heavyweight boxer. Oh, yeah, I heard of him, sure. And uh, his other brother played quarterback for the University of Pittsburgh football team. So, you know, Jake uh, came from a, you know, an athletic family wow. for sure. Johnny on the spot is Robert Cole tonight, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Very good job, Robert Cole. Um, and one of the other things, too, you know, uh, Ronnie, about Jake Pittler, one of the reasons that were given that he was brought to the Dodgers and stayed with the Dodgers so long was the fact that he was Jewish. 
Uh, right. Walter O'Malley uh, recognized the fact that you know there were a lot of Jewish fans, and he wanted that you know that presence, and uh, mm-hmm. you know so you know Jake was a fixture. Okay, again, I'm not sure whether it was Pitler's option not to go to L.A. or not, uh, or O'Malley didn't want to take him. I'm not sure of that myself. I don't know if you guys know the story about Well, that. I don't know, but let's try to figure it out. Jake was born, what, in 1897? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. 1897, so in 57, uh, in, in, uh, he wasn't that old. He was like barely 60 years old. Uh, why wouldn't he go out to the coast? Uh, evidently, his wife didn't want to go, or his uh, his family was entrenched, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know how yeah. well he was paid. Yeah, I mean, what I'm seeing here is it said when the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles, Pitlett chose to retire rather than move west. And then uh, he was replaced at first base by Greg Malevi. Right. Oh. Huh. I remember that name also. Yeah, Jake Pittler will always be, uh, you know, th- there's so many uh, excellent photographs of the old Brooklyn Dodgers, and more times than not, in the background, behind Campanella and Robinson, or Erskine, Don Besant, Roger Craig, whatever, sitting on a bench, there you see a little tiny portion of of what only Dodger fans could ascertain as being definitely Jake Pittler. And right. um, he, was, uh, he was everywhere. He was omnipresent. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about the Brooklyn Dodgers of my, of my generation, and I'll, I'll speak for both of you because you're both around my age, Jake Pittler was a fixture. Yes, he was. Yes, yeah, he was. Well, Jake Pittler at first and Billy Herman at third. I mean, that's who I grew up with as, as the two coaches. Now, Me something too. I didn't realize that I'm reading here now is that Jake Pittler was given nights, not once, but twice by Brooklyn fans, once in 1954 and once cool. again on August 25th, 1956. And Isn't that great? Reason, I didn't realize that. You shouldn't. You know what, Robert? You shouldn't be saying I'm reading right now. You should, off the top of my head, I remember blah, blah, blah. And then everybody would say, holy shit. Peter <laughs> Cole knows his oats. Oh, my God. Peter, if, off the top of my head, I don't even know what I had for dinner tonight. <laughs> Me either, I love Robert. it. I love it, Robert. That's funny. That is funny. All right, so Jake Pittler. There we go. We, we, we covered uh, number 31. And uh, yep. later, later, that number became very, very uh, well known in Los Angeles as uh, a certain catcher who uh, made the Hall of Fame and later played for the New York Mets, a guy by the name of Michael Piazza, whose yeah. father was a self-made millionaire and sold Mercedes Benzes. Um, anyway. Um, there's a guy in, in uh, the history of the Brooklyn Dodgers who I became interested in because of Robert Cole, and his name is Leon Cador. I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Yes. Um, it, it could only be Cadore maybe back in the day. I don't know. But Leon Cador was a pitcher for the Brooklyn Dodgers, and Robert Cole is going to uh, tell us about – Leon Cador, Robert Cole. Okay. Well, Leon's claim to fame, and it's quite a claim to fame. I first came across him many, many years ago, maybe I was 11 or 12, in one of those books of, you know, strange and fascinating facts, and they had all these different things in it. And one of the things in it was the longest baseball game in history, 26 innings that ended in a 1-1 tie, and it occurred on uh, May 1st, 1920. And the two pitchers were Leon Cador for the Brooklyn Dodgers and Joe Oshiger for the uh, uh, Boston Braves. And that still is the longest pitching uh, duel in history. Okay. One of the other things about Leon was he wound up marrying one of uh, Charles Ebbett's daughters, May, 
and uh, when the uh, sale of the Ebbets estate to Branch Rickey and um, some bankruptcy lawyer whose name I can't remember right now, uh, back in the 1940s, uh, Leon Cador was representing the Ebbets estate and the Ebbets heirs in that sale. Um, Cador also was a lieutenant in the First World War, and he was assigned as a commanding officer of one of the very few all-black army battalions uh, back then. And uh, he wrote that, you know, uh, his battalion fought right to the man uh, very fiercely, very hard. And back in those days, there was a myth that black soldiers would not fight, and this absolutely abolished that myth. Uh, one of the funny things that Cador said um, from World War I is he was crawling on the ground as enemy fire was coming overhead, and another, another soldier tugged at his sleeve, and he said, Leon, Leon, Leon Cador, that's you, right? And Cador said, yes, yes, it's me. And he goes, don't you remember me? Don't you remember me? Cador said to himself, I don't remember anything right now. I'm just trying to not get shot. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, don't you remember? I'm the guy that got the triple off, off you when we were in college together. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of those, one of those things. And Cador uh, was one of those guys that uh, for that time, he was six foot one, 200 pounds, which was at that, that time and age, very, very big. Yet he was not a what they call a uh, fastball pitcher. He was a pitcher that threw curves and stuff like that. He was also known as a pitcher that could throw and did throw spitballs, scuff balls, <laughs> shine balls. Uh, Casey Stengel, who was his roommate, said that he could be scratching the one side of the ball with his nail and spitting on the other side. <laughs> and then uh, Cador also had a, a part in one of the funnier things that happened in the early years. Casey Stengel had been traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates, and Casey was playing the outfield that day in Ebbets Field, and he had made an error in letting uh, three Brooklyn Dodgers score. And the fans who always adored Casey when he was a Brooklyn Dodger were, were razzing him and getting on him and you know, giving him the business. And when Casey went out to the outfield, Cador was sitting in the bullpen, and he happened to catch a sparrow. And he gave Casey the sparrow. Casey put the sparrow under his hat. The next time he came up to bat, the fans started giving Casey the business. Casey bowed, took the cap off, and the bird flew out of his hat. And Casey basically <laughs> gave the fans the bird that day. <laughs> I always knew the story about the bird underneath the hat. I didn't know that Leon Cador was the... Uh, was the uh, beginning of that yeah. story. That's so great. And, and you know, the fella in World War I who said, I'm the guy who got the triple off you in college, just mentioning the college, Leon Cador did not graduate from but matriculated at Gonzaga. He was a bulldog huh. 1906 to 1908. That's the college he went to. And he actually got uh, got done there at the age of 16. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so he's uh, quite a character, uh, you know, a good pitcher, you know, for the time, nothing spectacular. Uh, most people probably wouldn't even know him at all if it wasn't for well, the fact of that 26 inning I'd, I'd like to add that his lifetime ERA – was 314. Hmm. Yes. Not too and shabby. He had one good. year, Not he had too one shabby, year that if you do use the new metrics and the new, you know, adjusted ERA, his ERA yeah. was something like 1.20. Yeah. He also won 13 games, for, at least 13 games or more, four years in his career. So he was not a Humpty by any stretch of the imagination. He also could hit a little bit. He had five major league home runs, and his lifetime batting average was 208. The, the thing about the 26-inning game that amazes me is not that he pitched, well, not so much that he pitched the entire 26 innings, but 
he faced 96 batters in that yes. game. And if, if, if we just average it out, and, and this is very, very conservative, if he pitched four pitches to each of those batters, <laughs> he threw close to 400 pitches in that huh. game. Oh, absolutely, wow. yes. Yep. That, to me, that to me is mind-boggling. And not only that, but the day was a chilly, cold, off-and-on rainy day. So, I mean, they're, 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 I mean, and it's both of them. You know, Joe Oshiger also pitched 26 innings, and they're pitching 26 innings in not ideal temperature or weather conditions, and uh, yep. they both went all the way. You know, basically they each pitched the equivalent of three full games. Yes, uh, his opponent, Oshiger, uh only gave up five hits in 26 innings. That's pretty yeah. pretty impressive. Wow, yeah, pretty I'd say impressive. So. I'd say so. Oh boy, yep, that's that's <laughs> pretty impressive. It really is. And you know what? Leon Cador lives. Uh, first time we mentioned him on the show. Uh, maybe it won't be the last time, but uh, he now is among the ranks of the uh, Brooklyn Dodger elite, and uh, Leon Cador still lives, um, thanks to just, Robert Robert Cole. Just one last thing about Leon Cador and Joe Oshiger. Okay, they pitched 26 innings. The game took three hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a Yankee Red Sox game on a normal day. Yeah, in nine innings. <laughs> Absolutely, that's what I that's what I meant to say. Yeah, yeah. A regular nine inning game, Red Sox Yankees. Yep. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, Cador uh, Cador um, was a large guy for that for that time in 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 baseball. I remember. I remember uh, uh, publicly meeting man to man people like Wayne Terwilliger. Uh, j- just to mention Wayne Terwilliger for a moment, I went to a Dodger weekend uh, that they had in 2007 here in uh, New Jersey. Uh, on Saturday they had Brooklyn Dodgers, and on Sunday they had Los Angeles Dodgers, and I went both times. Took a lot of pictures, got a lot of autographs, et cetera, et cetera. But when I got there um, <coughs> on Saturday for the Brooklyn Dodgers, the first guy I meet as I walk in to the hotel is this little tiny guy, little wiry, skinny guy, and he comes up to me and he says, I had a Dodger uniform uh, jersey on and a Brooklyn Dodger hat. And I had a camera around my neck, and he said, "Are you the official photographer for the show?" And I said, "No, I'm not. I'm I'm just a fan. <laughs> I'm just here to to see the players, you know." He said, "Oh, okay." And I said, "Who are you?" And he said, "I'm Wayne Twilliger." And I said to him, "You're Wayne Twilliger, the guy who played for the 1951 Dodgers. <laughs> you you you." You're Wayne Twilliger. It was great, and we we talked, we laughed. He told me stories and everything. But I, the thing that kept mulling over in my head, over and over and over, and I couldn't stop it, was how could this guy play Major League Baseball? I could have lifted him up with one hand off the ground. Mm-hmm. He 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 appeared to be. Now I don't have his. I don't have a computer in front of me. I don't have my phone in front of me. I can't look up his statistics. I don't know if he was five foot six, hundred fifty pounds, whatever. He appeared to me that day um, to be like five three, one hundred twenty five pounds. I could have grabbed him by the shirt collar <laughs> and lifted him off the ground with my right hand. And I came back home, and I looked up his record, and he hit like 15 major league home runs. And I said to myself, how the hell could that man that I just met hours ago have hit 15 major league home runs? It's just 
incredible. Absolutely believe it or not, incredible. Believe it or not, Peter, he's listed as 5'11", 165 pounds. Okay. Well, I'm 6'2", 200, and by no means um, a large man for this day and age. But um, at 6'2", and 200, I feel like I could have actually grabbed him by the collar and lifted him up <laughs> above my head. He was just a wisp of a guy. And here's a guy who lasted in the major leagues more than a cup of coffee, that's for damn sure, played all over the place, hit home runs in the major leagues against major league pitching. It's just an incredible uh, awakening to a person such as myself. I, I just I couldn't believe it. But when you said that Leon Cador was uh, as big as he was for that age, right away I thought of Wayne Terwilliger, yeah. who I, I couldn't believe was such a wisp of a guy. Um, he also told me some fascinating things, not to get off topic, but Wayne Terwilliger told me that when he coached uh, at Washington with Ted Williams, when Ted Williams was the manager of Washington, he said that he was actually the manager. He called the hit and run. He called the steal. He called the bunts. He called, he called everything. Ted didn't call a thing. Ted just told people how to hit in the dugout and in the, uh, in the clubhouse. And uh, later on we find out that when Gil Hodges replaced him as manager in Washington that uh, Gil did such a great job with a very poor team that Gil, per, uh, that Ted perhaps held a grudge against Gil, and that's why Gil didn't make the Hall of Fame the first time he was supposed to be voted in when Ted Williams negated Campanella's vote over the phone because Campanella was in the hospital right. uh, after his uh, tragic. Uh, uh, that, that, that's another story for another show, but I just right. thought I'd bring it up. Um, I didn't mean to get so far off base, no pun intended. Uh, let's talk about another guy who played in Brooklyn for a while, um, a guy that my brother-in-law, uh, who has since passed away, my, my oldest sister's husband, uh, he was an international lawyer. He wrote, his name was Tom Smith. He graduated from law school with Mario Cuomo. He wrote, um, he wrote, uh, uh, speeches for both Cuomo and Nelson Rockefeller, and uh, he was a big Brooklyn Dodger fan and told me all throughout my young life, <clears throat> when I was a little kid, he told me that the best player he ever saw was a guy named Pete Reeser. And, um, <clears throat> Pistol Pete. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know Pete Reeser from uh, a hole in the ground. Uh, I was like um, seven seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, ten years old, eleven years old. I, I didn't even have a, a, a way to look him up. I guess I could have gone to the library, but I didn't. And uh, I remember him telling me, Pete Reeser it was the greatest baseball player I ever saw in my life. He kept telling me that over and over. He said the guy could do everything. He said he could play every single position on the field. Uh, he, he could hit <clears throat> for average. He could run. He could steal bases. He could throw. He could do everything. <clears throat> and um, he could I run said, into why walls haven't too. I ever? Why haven't I ever heard about him? And he yeah. said because he got injured so many times, and blah blah blah. And it went on and on and on and on. But anyway, I want Robert Cole, if he would be so kind, <clears throat> as to tell us a little bit about Harold Patrick Reeser. Okay. Well. Um, I'd like to kind of talk about how the Dodgers got hold of uh, Pete Reeser because he was not originally a Dodger. Um, he was in the Cardinal system. Branch Rickey, when Branch Rickey was running the Cardinals, signed Reeser along with hundreds, literally hundreds of other young players. And he basically put all these guys on farm teams. Uh, the commissioner at the time, Judge Landis, 
got upset, said, you know, the, the Cardinals were breaking rules and they were get, hoarding all these players and these players weren't allowed to go to other teams and blah, blah, blah. So he was going to release a lot of the players out to be signed by other teams. Ricky knew that Reeser was a, an exceptional talent, um, a tremendous prospect. He arranged for Reeser to go to the Brooklyn Dodgers where Larry McPhail uh, was running things. And Ricky and McPhail, you know, were fairly close at that time. Ricky said, look, we're going to send this player over to you. Okay, we'd like you to basically hide him, not use him much, and then in a year or two we'll come and make a trade and take him back. But I don't want Stop right there. Stop right there if you would. Yes, if sir. You would. Am I way off base, or does this have an echo? In my brain, I'm thinking the same, much the same thing happened with a Roberto Clemente, that the yes. Dodgers was supposed to hide – Yes. in their yes. farm system and actually list him as a pitcher to hide him? Yes, 1954, Clemente was okay. with the Brooklyn Dodgers. <clears throat> didn't, mean to knock you off, didn't mean to knock you off balance, but that just rang a bell in my brain. Not at all. In fact, that was helping me kind of back into this. Okay, Branch Rickey was part of the Pirates' uh, management in 1955. Prior to the 1955 season, the Dodgers elected not to protect Clemente because he hadn't been used that much and they were hoping nobody really knew his talent and they wanted to sneak him through the, the Rule 5 draft. Okay. Branch Rickey was having none of that, and many people say this was because of a payback back to the days of Pete Reeser. And what happened back in the days of Pete Reeser was uh, Reeser went to the Dodgers, okay, McPhail was trying to hide him, didn't want him played much. Reeser went along on a spring training trip, played a couple of innings, was outstanding. Leo DeRocha went bananas, wanted to bring him up right away. McPhail said, no, you can't. He's got to go back to the minors. Okay, that was one of the 742 times McPhail fired DeRocha. <laughs> DeRocha kept insisting that he had to have him. Um, <laughs> Okay. okay, he did go back to the minors. DeRocha brought him back up again late in 1940. Finally, McPhail said to Ricky, look, I, I can't honor that agreement I made with you anymore. DeRocha has seen him. Our fans have seen him. There's no way I can send him back to you without them, you know, running me out of town. And Reeser wind up staying with the Dodgers, and that kind of started to sour the relationship between Ricky and McPhail. Um, DeRocha, okay, played Reeser, played Reeser. Reeser would run into walls, uh, concussions. <laughs> Doctors said he shouldn't play. Okay, two days later, DeRocha would have him back out there again. <laughs> McPhail would insist on him, him playing. He broke his ankle. I mean, he ran into the wall so many times, they finally put padding on the walls uh, right. in the 1950s. Branch Rickey did that at Ebbets Field. <laughs> And that was to protect Reeser. By that time, it was, you know, too late, really. I mean, uh, he'd run into so many walls, and his skills had eroded so badly. Uh, there were times that he played the outfield of the Dodgers that he would get dizzy and he'd see two baseballs when it was being hit out to him. But hmm. Pete's right. Uh, many, many people say he would have been, had he stayed healthy, the greatest baseball player of all time. Um, he could do everything. I believe that. I believe that. He could play any position. He played short. He played third. He played all over the outfield. He stole, I believe, home plate six or seven times in one season, one year. Uh, mm. Just a phenomenal player. I remember my father talking about him all the time. And uh, by the time I was old enough to even know who he was, you know, he was now a coach with the Dodgers. Uh, right. Like That's when I got to meet him. I know he, I knew him pretty well, too, he and Jake Pidler. Right. Cool. They were both characters. They were both characters. Yeah, in fact, you know, one when year he, uh, Ricky right. offered to let Reeser sit out the entire year just to try to get him healthy, and Reeser refused. And 
just to show you the kind of guy Reeser was, even though DeRosha and McPhail mismanaged him, okay, he never blamed them. He said, I could have huh. said no, but I wanted oh. to play. That's true. That's true. Uh, a couple other things about Pistol Pete Reeser. He was born Harold Patrick Reeser. The reason his middle name is Patrick is because he was born on St. Patrick's Day in 1919, uh -huh. and his father put Patrick on the birth certificate as a middle name. But he got his nickname <clears throat> not from baseball, but when he was a little kid, a little boy in, in, in the neighborhood, he would go around with a toy holster with two uh, toy six-shooters in the holster because his favorite <laughs> movie hero was Two-Gun Pete. So he used to go around the neighborhood shooting caps uh, from his uh, toy uh, guns, and he became known as Pistol Pete as a very, very young man, very, very, very young. So Pistol Pete came way before baseball did. And another thing was that in high school, as we can all imagine, and it doesn't take too much uh, stretching of the imagination to wonder, he was a, a phenomenal athlete in every single sport when he was in high school. And the St. Louis Cardinals had a, um, a um, open tryout <clears throat> in St. Louis, where uh, Pete Reeser lived, and he went to the tryout, and he outran everybody, out threw everybody, out hit everybody, outdid everything of everybody, and the Cardinals didn't offer him anything, and he was bitterly disappointed, but a couple of days later, a guy showed up at the house at the Reeser household and said, "I want to speak to Pete Reeser. I want to speak to Harold Reeser and his father and mother." And they all got around the kitchen table, and the scout said, "Look, you're only 15 years old, but we want to block you from signing with the St. Louis Browns because the St. Louis Browns were hot to trot for for Pistol Pete Reeser also at that time." So what the Dodgers did was they asked the mother and father if they could hire, quote, unquote, hire Reeser as a chauffeur. Now, Reeser wasn't even old enough to drive, did not have a driver's license, but they hired him as a chauffeur on the books as a chauffeur. So he was under contract with the Brooklyn Dodgers, St. Louis Cardinals. Not, as, not as a player, but as a chauffeur, and that's the way the Dodgers wrestled him away from uh, from from being uh, uh, sucked up by the St. Louis Browns. And um, it, it's a wild, vast story because after he, he was on the in the St. Louis Cardinals system, uh, things happened like Robert just explained, where all of a sudden the uh, Commissioner of Baseball said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Branch Rickey is signing hundreds and hundreds of players. We have to, we have to get a hold of this. We have to get a, a, a grip on this. And he uh, said, you know, I'm going to state that the, the, this is the list of the people who are going to be free agents. And one of them was Pete Reeser and the Dodgers got him, blah, 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 this and that. But here, let's go a little further down the, down the pike. Um, Pete Reeser, when he broke into the major leagues with the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, in 1940, was a left-handed batter. He, he injured himself so badly and so often that there were times when he couldn't bat left-handed because of a shoulder problem, and he would bat right-handed. And in 1940... He, I'm not going to say switch hit because he did not hit right-handed against left-handed pitchers and did not hit left-handed against right-handed pitchers. He switch hit the way he physically felt. If he felt strong enough to bat right-handed, that's what he batted that day. And if he felt strong enough 
to bat left-handed, that's what he batted that day. He only switch hit from 1948 to 1952. Okay? This goes to show you, if you look at his statistics in 1941 and 42, this is a guy who batted any way he wanted to, any side he chose to bat, and he hit like 343 and won the batting crown. Hmm. This is an exceptional hitter, an exceptional major league hitter. And um, he was carried, he, he injured himself many, many times. We all know he, he cracked his skull. He actually fractured his skull. Baseball lore, uh, Sabre biography has him fracturing his skull five times. Oh, my. He swears in, he swears in interviews he only, he only, quote, unquote, I only fractured my skull four times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He was carried off the field in a stretcher 11 separate times. Six times he was conscious, five times he was unconscious. Unconscious, oh my God. Yep. Yeah. He woke up in the hospital. He woke up in the hospital after one of his uh, uh, ran into a wall, lost consciousness, carried off the field brought to a hospital, woke up in the hospital in his uniform, came back to where the Dodgers were playing. I don't know if it was on the road or at home. Came into the clubhouse with his uniform on, and DeRocher <laughs> said to him, how do you feel? He said, I don't feel that good, he said, but I'm, I'm a little woozy and stuff. DeRocher said, okay, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I just want you to sit on the bench as an inspiration to the rest of the guys. And yet, in the middle of the game, DeRocher put him, into, put him in. into the game. Put him into the game. Okay? So there's DeRocher mismanaging and using, like, like not unlike Dressen did with Don Newcomb, uh, just ran the guy in, in, into uh, hell. Uh, he died at age 62. Um he 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 was a coach for the Dodgers. He was also a coach for the Chicago Cubs when Leo DeRocha was the manager <laughs> in Chicago. And one day uh, DeRocha was ill, and he designated Pete Reeser to be the manager that day. And it was in it was uh, a game in which the Cubs won four to two. So the the managerial record, lifetime record of Pistol Pete Reeser as a major league manager is undefeated. He's one and O. Oh. <laughs> hey Pete. Peter, yep. can we jump into another little subject here? Sure. It's very disturbing. Okay. Uh my friend Bob Nightingale, who is the uh USA uh, baseball beat writer, has a huge article in the in the USA Today, about and it's entitled "Free Agency Freeze is Embarrassment." He writes there are over 90 unemployed free agents still on the market, including two 26-year-old stars, Harper and Machado, who have nowhere to go, waiting for someone to offer the kind of mega deals that was almost commonplace a few years ago. The market freeze has left agents furious, players exasperated, and fans frustrated with tension rising between the players and owners, threatening a work stoppage in 2021. Yet in, for an industry generating nearly $11 billion in revenue, with clubs generating record annual profits, the free agent marketplace has gone as icy as the polar vortex. Just four players have signed contracts longer than three years, and 16 teams have yet to sign a free agent to a multi-year contract. The union projects that 12 teams will begin the 2019 season with a substantial lower payroll than a year ago, creating imbalance, lack of competitiveness, and dreary pennant races. MLB has flatly rejected the notion 
that teams are rebuilding more than ever before in history, almost losing games purposely to improve their draft status. And he concludes, the only concept players and owners agree with these days is that it's bad for business, even embarrassing, that the creme, creme to the creme is the free agent market might still be at home when camp opens next week. Go ahead, blame whoever you want, but it's an awful, even frightful look for the baseball industry to have several of its biggest stars to not only be unemployed, but have only a few precious teams interested in their services. Play ball. Very disturbing. I'm going to let Robert Cole be the <clears throat> first one to comment on that. And that was very, very interesting, Ronnie Rabinovitz. Robert, what are your feelings on that? Okay, first of all, um, <clears throat> the so-called uh, cap, you know, the, uh, the amount that teams could uh, spend without being charged a surcharge, okay, was collectively bargained. Right. Players had input into that. Okay. Again, you know, I think players should get as much as they can. However, what is the top top dollar? Okay, you have two guys, Machado and Harper, that could have signed contracts with the teams they were with. Okay, they want ten year contracts. In my opinion, any team, even though these two guys are twenty six, okay. A 10-year contract takes them to 36. Anyone right. who, you know, does one of these contracts anymore is out of their minds. George yes. Steinbrenner is long gone, dead and buried, okay? There are no more George Steinbrenners. Okay, if Steinbrenner was still alive, Nightingale wouldn't have had an article to write. All right. right. If Steinbrenner had been given money, okay? The Dodgers have been throwing money around like crazy. The Red Sox. They've gotten burned numerous times, okay? There's a certain point where you just can't keep throwing money, okay? I understand where the agents are coming from, okay? I yeah. understand where the owners are coming from, but enough's enough. You and know, the players, and the point. players. You finally yeah. get to a point where, you know, how much is enough? And, and the uh, agents for uh, Machado and Harper, okay, are playing this game of chicken. Okay. Each yeah. one wants to be the biggest, the highest paid, and maybe they chicken themselves right out of a big payday for their guys. Look right. what happened with um, uh, what's the guy on the Red Sox that signed last year? Uh, J.D. Martinez. Okay. Martinez, Martinez, yeah. Martinez wound up taking millions <clears throat> less than he was originally mm -hmm. offered because he was trying to get more than he was originally offered. Okay, and he wound up taking a cut over what he was originally offered by a team. And that's what's happening again this year. I have no sympathy for Bryce Harper. I have no sympathy for Machado. In reality, they've wrecked this offseason. Okay? Teams didn't know what to do. A lot of players have been left hanging, not because of the teams, but because of Machado and Harper. Okay? If Machado and Harper had signed, you wouldn't have 96 other good ball players sitting out there. But teams are waiting to see where Harper and Machado go before they sign these other guys. So, I mean, I, as far as Harper and Machado go, I have no sympathy. Do you think there's a collusion going on with the owners? I do. <sighs> collusion is very difficult to prove. Collusion right. has to be okay, a willful agreement with all the owners, all right? Okay, what what you're having is not not a not a, a willful you know grouping where they all got together and said, hey, we're not going to give these guys more than X. Mm -hmm. Instead, you have you have a more reasonable thing. Okay, we don't know what some of these teams are offering right now. Okay, right. a couple of right. figures that we had come out. Okay, the agents jumped all over. You know, uh, guys like um, uh, the, the guys that. Oh, I forget the names off the top of my head, you know, that uh, bring out the figures all the time. And, um, you know, they're upset. They don't want numbers to be, be discussed. So we don't know, you know. I mean, right, right. was one of them offered $250 million. They want $300 million. You know, the numbers are right. crazy, okay. And, again, I'll, I'll just, you know, restate. Ten-year contracts should 
never, never happen and should never no. happen again. No, I don't think so. And yet the Nationals offered Harper a 10-year, $300 million contract at the end of the season, and then they rescinded it later. And the Phillies well, offered Machado go. a seven-year, $195 million offer, and he, uh, he pushed his nose up at that one. So, so they, I mean, they could be unemployed. Well, you know, well, is, is $300 if million I may. In chicken feed? You know, is $175 million chicken feed? And they were looking for more. Yeah. Like I said, I have no sympathy for them. Well, I don't think anyone has any baseball. sympathy. I don't think anyone has any sympathy for a guy who uh, is going to be making $35 million a year. Um, the... Um, the thing of it is, is this, and Robert Cole, by his definition of collusion, is 100% correct. However, I think there is collusion, if we can use that word loosely, uh, I do too. and not by its strict definition. I, I believe think. the owners are all, are all saying, screw you. Uh, right. We're not doing this. We're not doing this bullshit. And... Uh, yeah. And you want to know something? <clears throat> if you look at what these teams make, oh. what these franchises make, most of them, not all of them, but what they make, most of them. There's, there's, there's eight to ten, maybe more than ten, Major League Baseball clubs right now who could, quote, unquote, afford Machado or Harper. But they're not. Sure they could. They're, they're not. They're not making those offers because of the so-called. I'm going to. I'm going to use again, use it again with quotation marks around it. The collusion. They're they're not right. going to give in to this. And the other thing is, and we've discussed this before, and we all we all agree on this, is that <clears throat> Machado <clears throat> and Harper don't want to be the first one to sign before the other one because the other one wants to up him by a dollar. Right. Or yeah. what, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if if right. one guy gets 300, the other guy wants 301. Or right. one guy gets 299, the other guy wants 300 or whatever. And uh, that's just one upsmanship, and that's going to that's gonna happen, uh, whatever Is happens. Scott Boris, happen. Is Scott Boris the agent for both of them? No. No, no, Morris is the agent for um for Harper. Uh, for Harper. Right. Yeah. That's okay. it. Right. Yeah, and uh he's a hard ass and we all know that. He yeah. always has been. He's got more money than uh anybody in the world and um Yeah. He, he he's going to hold out. I mean, the thing that almost made me laugh out loud was that you said these guys are going to go without a job. There's no way they're going to go without a job. They might be signed uh, April 1st. But somebody's going to right. sign somebody, and they're, they're, Machado and Harper are not going to be sitting home watching their television. <laughs> they're yeah. they're going to be playing baseball somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's just a shame that it's that it, it, it's this long drawn out um, thing that we're, you know off the air. Um, <clears throat> I told you that I read a thing about the catcher for the uh, <clears throat> Miami Marlins. <clears throat> Yeah, Real Muto. Uh, Real, Real Muto. Muto. His, his, his rumors bounce just as buoyantly as the Machado uh, Harper rumors bounce. Yes. They bounce like, a, like one of the uh, pink <coughs> super <coughs> balls that we used to play with in the street when we played <laughs> yeah. stickball, the Spaldines. They bounce all over the place one day. Real Muto's going to the Reds. The next day he's going to the to the to the to the Padres. And the next day he's going the to the Phillies. Dodgers. And the next day he's going to the Phillies and the yeah. whatever. And and you know the the thing of it is is that the Miami uh, Marlins have a fan uh, day or whatever you call that, where the fans fan come fest. and they fan fest. Right. Fan fest. Okay. And they have it Friday or Saturday. They want to get rid of him before that. They don't want him there and then leave 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours after that uh, fan show. And so 
the pressure is on. So we'll see what happens. I, you know, it, it, for lack of a better thing, you know, now that football is over, this is, uh, although frustrating, it's also entertaining. And mm. for me, personally, and I see this <clears throat> day in and day out. I go to Major League Baseball trade rumors all the time and see the, you know, all of a sudden the Yankees are back in the picture, and then there's a yeah, mystery team, yeah. and then it's right. the White Sox, and then it's, a, you yeah. know, well, his cousin married uh, his lawyer's brother's daughter, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, he might want to play with that guy, and then blah, blah, blah. And they're grasping at straws. They have, they, their job is to write. They're writers, right. and they have to write something every day. They don't get paid. They have to write. You remember so they just, the winter meetings? They used to be fun. They were such a boring thing this year. I mean, yep. I felt badly for the MLB announcers. They were trying to fill time. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, like sure. I said, everybody's got their job to do. MLB TV. Yeah. All the writers they have a job to do. They have to write something. They have to say something. So it's right. you know it's almost laughable when you put on MLB TV at night. Uh, it's almost laughable because every single show is the same thing. Where's Machado yeah. going? Where's Harper yeah. going? And yeah. to a lesser extent, where's Re- Real Muto going? Uh, it, it's gotten to the point now where it's almost, uh, you know, pull the plug on the show for a couple of weeks yeah. and come back on the air. But, of course, you can't do that. Everybody has to, uh, you know, uh, earn their paycheck or, or, right. or work for their paycheck, whatever. And um, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, we all have our favorite teams. We all, right. uh, we, we all are rooting, you know, no matter what we say out loud, we, we, we're rooting when we go to bed at night and we're lying in the dark, we're saying to ourselves, wow, my team would really look good with Machado on it next season or yeah. my team would really look good right. with Harper on it next season or I hope we get Kluber, I hope we get Rio Muto. You know, yeah. and, you know, you just hope and hope and stuff. But uh, there's a lot of money involved. And yeah. we don't even, we don't even know, we don't, we can't even, we can't even dream about money like that. We're just regular folks. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, we don't know what it means to play one baseball game and earn $300,000. <laughs> right. Think about that. Yeah, yeah. Three hundred thousand dollars for one baseball game. For one game. And if you, yeah. you put it like that, you know, you put it like that, and you say, well, you know, Kershaw is overpaid. He makes thirty-three and a half million a year. Yeah, well, he makes thirty starts a year. So Bryce Harper makes one hundred and fifty, one hundred sixty starts a year, and Machado mm-hmm. too. So, like, who's making more per game? It's 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 amazing. Kershaw. Money. Kershaw. Of course. But that yeah. the, the 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 problem is that these figures almost become mythical. They become right. like a cartoon. They they sure. they, they, sure. they 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 become unreal. They they're yeah. not even like on your kitchen table where you can touch them. You you no. can't. No. You read them in the newspaper or you see them on T V and you just you see all these zeros lined up after a certain amount and uh you don't you can't even fathom that that much money you know what i mean so it's yeah. like the uh, Dodgers, i think they're done <clears throat> i think they're not going to make any more moves well that's that's what i read that's my too prediction. but that's my you know, prediction. who can blame them yeah right who can blame them i mean they got until uh the trading deadline, if they need to. Right, right. We'll see. We'll have to see. I don't know happens. what to say about that. But you know no. what? This was a good show. Uh, yeah, Leon Cador, Pistol Pete Razor. Uh, we talked about some good stuff, Jake as Pender. always. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank both of you for uh, once again – Week after week after week after week, the yeoman job that both of you fellows do, Robert Cole and Ron Rabinovitz, in, in helping the show out. Thank you very, very much, and we will continue to do this. It's a lot of fun. It's interesting, and um, 
I look forward already to next week. I want to thank you both for the participating this week. And thank you, Pete. A, a fine good night. Thank you very much. Good night, Robert good night. and Ronnie. Good night. Good night.